Hello there. Today we're having a look at the characteristics and processes associated with the development of granite domes and tors. Um, I will frequently refer to domes as bornhearts because there is some confusion about the term dome. Geologists use it to mean batholith very often. Right, just to revise some of the igneous features that we did in grade 10 and today we are looking at laccoliths, lopoliths, and batholiths, and what happens to them when the surface erodes. We should just note that the laccolith is responsible for doming. It gets inserted into sedimentary rock layers and pushes them up like that, and then lopoliths can cause sedimentary rock layers to be basined. Now we looked at that with the Michalisberg with the Bushveld igneous complex and also of course batholiths as they move up can cause strata to tilt but go back to the previous exercise to have a look at that. Right well what are the processes? If we were to take a cross section of say a kilometer deep or half a kilometer deep section of granite it might look something like this. Here you've got a deeply weathered layer of material. This is weathered rock and it can be very deep. There are places in Nigeria where this is three or four hundred meters deep but in other times it can be shallow. And in South Africa you will see this kind of terrain um, throughout the Kruger Park in the, in the Mpumalanga Lowfeld, Limpopo in the Lowfeld there and then there are a few other places the Northwestern Cape and so on where they appear and then there are a few isolated batholiths sticking out in various places. The Johannesburg granite is one, most of northern Johannesburg is on granite. The Friedefort Dome, the famous meteorite impact crater that we looked at in the previous lesson is also granite and then very famous Powell Mountain at Powell is a batholith. But now what we're doing is we're looking at the detail of the structure as to what's going on underground. Now batholiths are formed very deep, 10 kilometers down underground, and they're formed, they're igneous rock obviously, so they are formed from molten material, and they cool down until they solidify. Now they solidify at about 700 degrees Celsius. That means they've got to cool another 650 degrees or more before they um, are absolutely solid and as we see them at the surface. As that cooling takes place you will be aware that solid materials shrink or contract as they cool. Now in rock that means you're going to cause cracks. Now in deep rock under pressure those cracks are going to tend to be at right angles to each other. Now in geometry we use the word orthogonal to describe two lines that are at right angles to each other. So these cracks which are also referred to as joints, different from faults. Faults is a crack where there is movement, but this is simply a crack that develops as a result of particularly contraction as the rock cools. And you're going to get orthogonal or right angle joints. Now you can imagine a huge body of rock cooling down in a plate tectonic environment. It's not sitting absolutely still. It's going to be moving around a little bit. There'll be uneven pressure and that means that the joint pattern is going to vary enormously from a joint frequency is the term we use where the joints are very close together and then a lower joint frequency where the joints are far apart. Now what happens within these compartments is that the rock is going to weather at different rates. If you've got rain falling on the soil above its moisture is going to penetrate and it's going to penetrate into the joints. So where there are joints you are going to get deeper weathering than where there are no joints. So where the joints are very far apart, the weathering will be shallower. Where the joints are very close together, the weathering will be deeper. So we refer to these as deep weathering processes. And because of the joint frequency, we can get some very unusual shapes forming underneath this overlying deep weathered soil layer. And we'll show you some pictures of those later on. So, orthogonal joints. Now, this boundary between the weathered layer and the unweathered rock can be very marked. So, here is the 
yellow, typically yellow granite soil, and a very sharp boundary between that and the granite underneath. And this is called a weathering front. And this means that when you get erosion happening, so if there's isostatic adjustment upwards, or, an, or the climate becomes wetter and erosion increases, then this weathered material here can be stripped off very rapidly and then it encounters this unweathered material and you get these shapes being exposed at the surface. So the shapes that we see in granite at the surface have generally been formed under the swell. Then there's another process going on here that as the rock gets closer to the surface as the overlying material is eroded off so all of this gets eroded off and over millions of years maybe there was 10 or 20 kilometers of rock above here then the pressure is reduced and that causes within these orthogonal joint compartments which vary enormously in size there is expansion and that causes the rock to crack in circular forms like this and those are called concentric joints now you may have had somebody tell you that this that these concentric peeling of layers of rock is due to heating and cooling. That is not true and it's also not true due to changes in moisture. On this scale it's due to expansion as the pressure is removed from above. Now that removal of pressure from above is called basal unloading. B-A-S-A-L unloading as you would unload a truck. So basal unloading causes expansion and then these concentric joints like this with and notice they are controlled by the frequency the spacing of the orthogonal joints and that's going to leave you with all sorts of different shapes under the surface once the material is stripped away completely from the surface then we get different shapes and they have different names the born heart is a large dome shaped feature and as I said earlier, these are sometimes called domes, but geologists call a dome the entire granite feature. So while the, uh, your syllabus refers to a Bornhardt as a dome, I'm just going to remind you that Bornhardt is the correct term. Of course, if the question is appropriate in the exam, then you must choose the answer dome, even if you know that it's not entirely correct always. Then here we have tors. And as the weathering takes place within smaller compartments, it creates boulders and rocks piled up on each other. And a outcrop of rock that is flush with the surface, there's not a big steep side, that's called a ruari. And that of course leaves these areas in between this sticking out rock where you've got deep weathered soil. Now in some environments, the spacing between your outcrops may be kilometers and most of the area is deep weathered. In other areas like the Matopas Mountains in southwestern Zimbabwe, then you will find that there are many more of these features with, a, with relatively few flat areas in between. This picture is the surrounding view of Nelspreit, Bombela in Pumalanga, and this is all a granite terrain. So you have these born hearts sticking up sometimes called domes and they're all over the place wherever you see these outcrops of rock those are parts of born hearts tors are not a, not so easy to see because typically they've got a lot of bushes growing on them so while there are tors in this picture you would need to get drive right up next to them to see them now notice this is all the same granite batholith which is in fact about 60 kilometers in diameter so this picture is just a small part of them and each of these is just a part of an outcrop of Bornhart is just a part of an outcrop of a much bigger batholith and there you in the background you see the same now notice of course that these shapes also the slopes are convex which makes them very different from the sedimentary strata slopes this is one of the most famous ge geomorphological features in Johannesburg. It's called the Lone Hill Tor. And now you can see the individual boulders. But let's have a closer look at this. First of all, the overall shape is that of a Bornhardt. And you can see the concentric joints like that. But this would have formed like this because they're also, in addition to those bigger concentric joints, there are the smaller joints. And 
so it does actually get quite complicated as to how it weathers but once the weathering starts and trees get their roots into it they quickly widen the joints and you get the breakup of the kopi and it becomes a tor. This is a small born heart um, in the Kruger National Park. It is called Manung. It's a few kilometers from Pretorius Corp rest camp and about um, eight kilometers in from the Numbi Gate. Now what we see here is the flat area of deeply weathered soils. If you were to dig a hole down here, you might have to go down 10 meters before you hit the granite underneath. But there we see the classic shape. And looking closely there, you can see the concentric joints. So that slab there has broken off as a result of this concentric joint due to basal unloading. This is now an aerial photograph of an area just outside the Kruger National Park. And what we see here is very clearly the role the joints play in defining these bone hearts. All of these white areas here are bone hearts of various sizes. But look at the joints. There is a joint there, there, and there. Now you may ask, well, these aren't at right angles. Well, there may be two sets of joints here because, as I said, if you've got a plate tectonic environment and the, as the batholith cools, it has been bent a little bit in different directions, you're going to get different joint systems. But if you look at this, this is more or less right angles like that. So there are your orthogonal joints. This is on a very big scale. You look at this down here, that's 350 meters across there. So that length there is about 350 meters. But if you look more closely, there you can see a joint going across there. You can see the joints here, incidentally, because trees can get their roots in them and grow better. And you can see all of these straight lines here are where there are joints. This one is a river but the rest of these are of different scales. Right, looking at Powell Mountain. Now, Powell Mountain is interesting because here you've got the complete outline of a batholith. Now, batholiths are normally much bigger than this, but this north-south is about 8 kilometers. As I said earlier, the Nelspreit granite, the Johannesburg granite are about 60 kilometers in diameter. The Friedefall Dome is about 30 kilometers. But here you have a whole batholith that has been intruded and on top of it there we see the typical white granite outcrop and again you can see the joint control here. Look at that line across there, the shape of the dam also you can see those right angle joints. There's clearly joints in this direction which the rivers have exploited so the river valleys are going along the joints. There's a river valley, there's a river valley. So your joints are parallel and their right angle ones going across it. If we look at that on the 1 in 50,000 map, we can clearly see that there is a convex shape here. If you look at this slope over here, the contours start close together at the bottom of the slope, and as you go up the hill, they get further apart. So that's over here. As you go up to the top of the hill here, they get further apart. This photograph is a bigger scale than, than the map, so this circular route here of the road is that one there. So we're looking at a convex slope coming from the town down there which is on the edge of the map and as you go up the slope the contours get further apart and that of course distinguishes it from a um, horizontal um, convex slope that we saw two lessons ago. Right this has also got further detail we can see as I said there is a batholith so let's have a look at that from ground level. There it is there. Now this photograph is taken from about here, looking in that direction. So that little lump there is that one. The big one is that, and then this one here is this. Now this is almost a ruari. It hardly has a slope at all. You'll easily be able to walk up onto that, whereas this is definitely a born heart. And here again we can see the peeling of the concentric layers slabs of rock coming off due to basal unloading. Then not quite so clear on the photograph, there are a number of other little outcrops of granite. Right, well that is the basic geology and geomorphology of massive igneous rocks. Do the assessment and enjoy.